six. The wind blew fierce and strong, and it pelted them with bits of sticks, sand, and little rocks. Juana and Kino gathered their clothing tighter about them and covered their noses and went out into the world. The sky was brushed clean by the wind, and the stars were cold in a black sky. The two walked carefully, and they avoided the center of the town, where some sleeper in a doorway might see them pass. For the town closed itself in against the night, and anyone who moved about in the darkness would be noticeable. Kino threaded his way around the edge of the city and turned north, north by the stars, and found the rutted, sandy road that led through the brushy country toward Loreto, where the miraculous virgin has her station. Kino could feel the blown sand against his ankles, and he was glad, for he knew there would be no tracks. The little light from the stars made out for him the narrow road through the brushy country, and Kino could hear the pad of Juana's feet behind him. He went quickly and quietly and Juana trotted behind him to keep up. Some ancient thing stirred in Kino. Through his fear of dark and the devils that haunt the night, there came a rush of exhilaration. Some animal thing was moving in him, so that he was cautious and wary and dangerous. Some ancient thing out of the past of his people was alive in him. The wind was at his back, and the stars guided him. The wind cried and whisked in the brush, and the family went on monotonously hour after hour. They passed no one and saw no one. At last to their right the waning moon arose, and when it came up the wind died down and the land was still. Now they could see the little road ahead of them, deep cut with sand-drifted wheel tracks. With the wind gone there would be footprints, but they were a good distance from the town, and perhaps their tracks might not be noticed. Kino walked carefully in a wheel rut, and Juana followed in his path. One big cart going to the town in the morning could wipe out every trace of their passage. All night they walked and never changed their pace. Once Coyotito awakened, and Juana shifted him in front of her and soothed him until he went to sleep again. And the evils of the night were about them. The coyotes cried and laughed in the brush, and the owls screeched and hissed over their heads. And once some large animal lumbered away, crackling the undergrowth as it went, and Kino gripped the handle of the big working knife and took a sense of protection from it. The music of the pearl was triumphant in Kino's head, and the quiet melody of the family underlay it, and they wove themselves into the soft padding of sandaled feet in the dust. All night they walked, and in the first dawn Kino searched the roadside for a covert to lie in during the day. He found his place near to the road, a little clearing where deer might have lain, and it was curtained thickly with the dry, brittle trees that lined the road. And when Juana had seated herself and had settled to nurse the baby, Kino went back to the road. He broke a branch and carefully swept the footprints where they had turned from the roadway. And then, in the first light, he heard the creak of a wagon, and he crouched beside the road and watched a heavy two-wheeled cart go by, drawn by slouching oxen. And when it had passed out of sight, he went back to the roadway and looked at the rut and found that the footprints were gone. And again he swept out his traces and went back to Juana. She gave him the soft corn cakes Apollonia had packed for them, and after a while she slept a little. But Kino sat on the ground and stared at the earth in front of him. He watched the ants moving, a little column of them near to his foot, and he put his foot in their path. Then the column climbed over his instep and continued on its way, and Kino left his foot there and watched them move over it. The sun arose hotly. They were not near the gulf now, and the air was dry and hot, so that the brush cricked with heat and a good resinous smell came from it. And when Juana awakened, when the sun was high, Kino told her things she knew already. Beware of that kind of tree there he said, pointing. Do not touch it, for if you do and then touch your eyes, it will blind you. And beware of the tree that bleeds. See that one over there, for if you break it, the red blood will flow from it, and it is evil luck. And she nodded and smiled a little at him, for she knew these things. Will they follow us? she asked. Do you think they will try to find us? They will try, said Kino. Whoever finds us will take the pearl. Oh, they will try. And Juana said, Perhaps the dealers were right, and the pearl has no value. Perhaps this has all been an illusion. 
Kino reached into his clothes and brought out the pearl. He let the sun play on it until it burned in his eyes. No, he said. They would not have tried to steal it if it had been valueless. Do you know who attacked you? Was it the dealers? I do not know, he said. I didn't see them. He looked into his pearl to find his vision. When we sell it at last, I will have a rifle, he said. And he looked into the shining surface for his rifle. But he saw only a huddled dark body on the ground, with shining blood dripping from its throat. And he said quickly, We will be married in a great church. And in the pearl he saw Juana, with her beaten face, crawling home through the night. Our son must learn to read, he said frantically, and there in the pearl Coyotito's face, thick and feverish from the medicine. And Kino thrust the pearl back into his clothing, and the music of the pearl had become sinister in his ears, and it was interwoven with the music of evil. The hot sun beat on the earth, so that Kino and Juana moved into the lacy shade of the brush, and small gray birds scampered on the ground in the shade. In the heat of the day, Kino relaxed and covered his eyes with his hat and wrapped his blanket about his face to keep the flies off, and he slept. But Juana did not sleep. She sat, quiet as a stone, and her face was quiet. Her mouth was still swollen where Kino had struck her, and big flies buzzed around the cut on her chin. But she sat as still as a sentinel, and when Coyotito awakened, she placed him on the ground in front of her and watched him wave his arms and kick his feet, and he smiled and gurgled at her until she smiled too. She picked up a little twig from the ground and tickled him, and she gave him water from the gourd she carried in her bundle. Kino stirred in a dream, and he cried out in a guttural voice, and his hand moved in symbolic fighting. And then he moaned and sat up suddenly, his eyes wide and his nostrils flaring. He listened and heard only the cricking heat and the hiss of distance. What is it? Juana asked. Hush, he said. You were dreaming, perhaps. But he was restless, and when she gave him a corn cake from her store, he paused in his chewing to listen. He was uneasy and nervous. He glanced over his shoulder. He lifted the big knife and felt its edge. When Coyotito gurgled on the ground, Kino said, Keep him quiet. What is the matter? Juana asked. I don't know. He listened again, an animal light in his eyes. He stood up then, silently, and crouched low, he threaded his way through the brush toward the road. But he did not step into the road. He crept into the cover of a thorny tree and peered out along the way he had come. And then he saw them, moving along. His body stiffened, and he drew down his head and peeked out from under a fallen branch. In the distance he could see three figures, two on foot and one on horseback. But he knew what they were, and a chill of fear went through him. Even in the distance he could see the two on foot moving slowly along, bent low to the ground. Here one would pause and look at the earth while the other joined him. They were the trackers. They could follow the trail of a bighorn sheep in the stone mountains. They were as sensitive as hounds. Here he and Juana might have stepped out of the wheel rut, and these people from the inland, these hunters, could follow, could read a broken straw or a little tumbled pile of dust. Behind them, on a horse, was a dark man, his nose covered with a blanket, and across his saddle a rifle gleamed in the sun. Kino lay as rigid as the tree limb. He barely breathed, and his eyes went to the place where he had swept out the track. Even the sweeping might be a message to the trackers. He knew these inland hunters. In a country where there was little game, they managed to live because of their ability to hunt, and they were hunting him. They scuttled over the ground like animals and found a sign and crouched over it while the horsemen waited. The trackers whined a little, like excited dogs on a warming trail. Kino slowly drew his big knife to his hand and made it ready. He knew what he must do. If the trackers found the swept place, he must leap for the horseman, kill him quickly, and take the rifle. That was his only chance in the world. And as the three drew nearer on the road, Kino dug little pits with his sandaled toes so that he could leap without warning, so that his feet would not slip. He had only a little vision under the fallen limb. Now Juana, back in her hidden place, heard the pad of the horse's hoofs, and Coyotito gurgled. She took him up quickly and put him under her shawl and gave him her breast, and he was silent. 
When the trackers came near, Kino could see only their legs, and only the legs of the horse from under the fallen branch. He saw the dark, horny feet of the men in their ragged white clothes, and he heard the creak of leather of the saddle and the clink of spurs. The trackers stopped at the swept place and studied it, and the horseman stopped. The horse flung his head up against the bit, and the bit roller clicked under his tongue, and the horse snorted. Then the dark trackers turned and studied the horse and watched his ears. Kino was not breathing, but his back arched a little, and the muscles of his arms and legs stood out with tension, and a line of sweat formed on his upper lip. For a long moment the trackers bent over the road, and then they moved on, slowly, studying the ground ahead of them, and the horsemen moved after them. The trackers scuttled along, stopping, looking, and hurrying on. They would be back, Kino knew. They would be circling and searching, peeping, stooping, and they would come back sooner or later to his covered track. He slid backward and did not bother to cover his tracks. He could not. Too many little signs were there, too many broken twigs and scuffed places and displaced stones. And there was a panic in Kino now, a panic of flight. The trackers would find his trail, he knew it. There was no escape except in flight. He edged away from the road and went quickly and silently to the hidden place where Juana was. She looked up at him in question. Trackers, he said, come. And then a helplessness and a hopelessness swept over him, and his face went black and his eyes were sad. Perhaps I should let them take me. Instantly Juana was on her feet, and her hand lay on his arm. You have the pearl, she cried hoarsely. Do you think they would take you back alive to say they had stolen it? His hand strayed limply to the place where the pearl was hidden under his clothes. They will find it, he said weakly. Come, she said, come. And when he did not respond, do you think they would let me live? Do you think they would let the little one here live? Her goading struck into his brain, his lips snarled, and his eyes were fierce again. Come, he said, we will go into the mountains. Maybe we can lose them in the mountains. Frantically he gathered the gourds and the little bags that were their property. Kino carried a bundle in his left hand, but the big knife swung free in his right hand. He parted the brush for Juana, and they hurried to the west, toward the high stone mountains. They trotted quickly through the tangle of the undergrowth. This was panic flight. Kino did not try to conceal his passage as he trotted, kicking the stones, knocking the telltale leaves from the little trees. The high sun streamed down on the dry, creaking earth so that even the vegetation ticked in protest. But ahead were the naked granite mountains, rising out of erosion rubble and standing monolithic against the sky. And Kino ran for the high place, as nearly all animals do when they are pursued. This land was waterless, furred with the cacti which could store water, and with the great rooted brush which could reach deep into the earth for a little moisture and get along on very little. And underfoot was not soil, but broken rock, split into small cubes, great slabs, but none of it water-rounded. Little tufts of sad, dry grass grew between the stones, grass that had sprouted with one single rain and headed, dropped its seed and died. Horned toads watched the family go by and turned their little pivoting dragon heads. And now and then a great jackrabbit, disturbed in his shade, bumped away and hid behind the nearest rock. The singing heat lay over this desert country, and ahead the stone mountains looked cool and welcoming. And Kino fled. He knew what would happen. A little way along the road, the trackers would become aware that they had missed the path, and they would come back, searching and judging. And in a little while, they would find the place where Kino and Juana had rested. From there it would be easy for them, these little stones, the fallen leaves and the whipped branches, the scuffed places where a foot had slipped. Kino could see them in his mind, slipping along the track, whining a little with eagerness, and behind them, dark and half-disinterested, the horseman with the rifle. His work would come last, for he would not take them back. Oh, the music of evil sang loud in Kino's head now. It sang with the whine of heat and with the dry ringing of snake rattles. It was not large and overwhelming now, but secret and poisonous, and the pounding of his heart gave it undertone and rhythm. The way began to rise, and as it did, the rocks grew larger. But now Kino had put a little distance between his family and the trackers. Now, on the first rise, he rested. 
He climbed a great boulder and looked back over the shimmering country, but he could not see his enemies, not even the tall horsemen riding through the brush. Juana had squatted in the shade of the boulder. She raised her bottle of water to Coyotito's lips. His little dried tongue sucked greedily at it. She looked up at Kino when he came back. She saw him examine her ankles, cut and scratched from the stones and brush, and she covered them quickly with her skirt. Then she handed the bottle to him, but he shook his head. Her eyes were bright in her tired face. Kino moistened his cracked lips with his tongue. Juana, he said, I will go on and you will hide. I will lead them into the mountains, and when they have gone past, you will go north to Loreto or to Santa Rosalia. Then, if I can escape them, I will come to you. It is the only safe way. She looked full into his eyes for a moment. No, she said. We go with you. I can go faster alone, he said harshly. You will put the little one in more danger if you go with me. No, said Juana. You must. It is the wise thing, and it is my wish, he said. No, said Juana. He looked then for weakness in her face, for fear or irresolution, and there was none. Her eyes were very bright. He shrugged his shoulders helplessly then, but he had taken strength from her. When they moved on, it was no longer panic flight. The country as it rose toward the mountains changed rapidly. Now there were long outcroppings of granite with deep crevices between, and Kino walked on bare, unmarkable stone when he could and leaped from ledge to ledge. He knew that wherever the trackers lost his path, they must circle and lose time before they found it again. And so he did not go straight for the mountains any more. He moved in zigzags, and sometimes he cut back to the south and left a sign and then went toward the mountains over bare stone again. And the path rose steeply now, so that he panted a little as he went. The sun moved downward toward the bare stone teeth of the mountains, and Kino set his direction for a dark and shadowy cleft in the range. If there were any water at all, it would be there, where he could see even in the distance a hint of foliage. And if there were any passage through the smooth stone range, it would be by this same deep cleft. It had its danger, for the trackers would think of it too, but the empty water bottle did not let that consideration enter. And as the sun lowered, Kino and Juana struggled wearily up the steep slope toward the cleft. High in the gray stone mountains, under a frowning peak, a little spring bubbled out of a rupture in the stone. It was fed by shade-preserved snow in the summer, and now and then it died completely, and bare rocks and dry algae were on its bottom. But nearly always it gushed out, cold and clean and lovely. In the times when the quick rains fell, it might become a freshet, and send its column of white water crashing down the mountain cleft, but nearly always it was a lean little spring. It bubbled out into a pool, and then fell a hundred feet to another pool, and this one, overflowing, dropped again, so that it continued down and down, until it came to the rubble of the upland, and there it disappeared altogether. There wasn't much left of it then anyway, for every time it fell over an escarpment the thirsty air drank it and it splashed from the pools to the dry vegetation. The animals from miles around came to drink from the little pools, and the wild sheep and the deer, the pumas and raccoons and the mice all came to drink. And the birds which spent the day in the brushland came at night to the little pools that were like steps in the mountain cleft. Beside this tiny stream, wherever enough earth collected for root hold, colonies of plants grew. Wild grape and little palms, maidenhair fern, hibiscus, and tall pampas grass with feathery rods raised above the spike leaves. And in the pool lived frogs and water skaters, and water worms crawled on the bottom of the pool. Everything that loved water came to these few shallow places. The cats took their prey there and strewed feathers and lapped water through their bloody teeth. The little pools were places of life because of the water, and places of killing because of the water, too. The lowest step, where the stream collected before it tumbled down a hundred feet and disappeared into the rubbly desert, was a little platform of stone and sand. Only a pencil of water fell into the pool, but it was enough to keep the pool full and to keep the ferns green in the underhang of the cliff, and wild grape climbed the stone mountain, and all manner of little plants found comfort here. 
The freshets had made a small sandy beach through which the pool flowed, and bright green watercress grew in the damp sand. The beach was cut and scarred and padded by the feet of animals that had come to drink and to hunt. The sun had passed over the stone mountains when Kino and Juana struggled up the steep, broken slope and came at last to the water. From this step they could look out over the sun-beaten desert to the blue gulf in the distance. They came utterly weary to the pool, and Juana slumped to her knees and first washed Coyotito's face and then filled her bottle and gave him a drink. And the baby was weary and petulant, and he cried softly until Juana gave him her breast, and then he gurgled and clucked against her. Kino drank long and thirstily at the pool. For a moment then he stretched out beside the water and relaxed all his muscles and watched Juana feeding the baby. And then he got to his feet and went to the edge of the step where the water slipped over, and he searched the distance carefully. His eyes set on a point, and he became rigid. Far down the slope he could see the two trackers. They were little more than dots or scurrying ants, and behind them a larger ant. Juana had turned to look at him, and she saw his back stiffen. How far? she asked quietly. They will be here by evening, said Kino. He looked up the long, steep chimney of the cleft where the water came down. We must go west, he said, and his eyes searched the stone shoulder behind the cleft. And thirty feet up on the gray shoulder he saw a series of little erosion caves. He slipped off his sandals and clambered up to them, gripping the bare stone with his toes, and he looked into the shallow caves. They were only a few feet deep, wind-hollowed scoops, but they sloped slightly downward and back, Kino crawled into the largest one and lay down and knew that he could not be seen from the outside. Quickly he went back to Juana. You must go up there. Perhaps they will not find us there, he said. Without question she filled her water bottle to the top, and then Kino helped her up to the shallow cave and brought up the packages of food and passed them to her. And Juana sat in the cave entrance and watched him. She saw that he did not try to erase their tracks in the sand. Instead, he climbed up the brush cliff beside the water, clawing and tearing at the ferns and wild grape as he went. And when he had climbed a hundred feet to the next bench, he came down again. He looked carefully at the smooth rock shoulder toward the cave to see that there was no trace of passage. And last, he climbed up and crept into the cave beside Juana. When they go up, he said, we will slip away, down to the lowlands again. I am afraid only that the baby may cry. You must see that he does not cry. He will not cry, she said, and she raised the baby's face to her own and looked into his eyes, and he stared solemnly back at her. He knows, said Juana. Now Kino lay in the cave entrance, his chin braced on his crossed arms, and he watched the blue shadow of the mountain move out across the brushy desert below until it reached the gulf, and the long twilight of the shadow was over the land. The trackers were long in coming, as though they had trouble with the trail Kino had left. It was dusk when they came at last to the little pool. And all three were on foot now, for a horse could not climb the last steep slope. From above they were thin figures in the evening. The two trackers scurried about on the little beach, and they saw Kino's progress up the cliff before they drank. The man with the rifle sat down and rested himself, and the trackers squatted near him and in the evening the points of their cigarettes glowed and receded. And then Kino could see that they were eating, and the soft murmur of their voices came to him. Then darkness fell, deep and black in the mountain cleft. The animals that used the pool came near and smelled men there and drifted away again into the darkness. He heard a murmur behind him. Juana was whispering, Coyotito. She was begging him to be quiet. Kino heard the baby whimper, and he knew from the muffled sounds that Juana had covered his head with her shawl. Down on the beach a match flared, and in its momentary light Kino saw that two of the men were sleeping, curled up like dogs, while the third watched, and he saw the glint of the rifle in the matchlight. And then the match died, but it left a picture on Kino's eyes. He could see it, just how each man was, two sleeping, curled up, and the third squatting in the sand with the rifle between his knees. Kino moved silently back into the cave. Juana's eyes were two sparks reflecting a low star. Kino crawled quietly close to her, and he put his lips near to her cheek. There is a way, 
he said. But they will kill you. If I get first to the one with the rifle, Kino said, I must get to him first, then I will be all right. Two are sleeping. Her hand crept out from under her shawl and gripped his arm. They will see your white clothes in the starlight. No, he said, and I must go before moonrise. He searched for a soft word and then gave it up. If they kill me, he said, lie quietly. And when they are gone away, go to Loreto. Her hand shook a little, holding his wrist. There is no choice, he said. It is the only way. They will find us in the morning. Her voice trembled a little. Go with God, she said. He peered closely at her, and he could see her large eyes. His hand fumbled out and found the baby, and for a moment his palm lay on Coyotito's head. And then Kino raised his hand and touched Juana's cheek, and she held her breath. Against the sky, in the cave entrance, Juana could see that Kino was taking off his white clothes, for dirty and ragged though they were, they would show up against the dark night. His own brown skin was a better protection for him. And then she saw how he hooked his amulet neck string about the horn handle of his great knife, so that it hung down in front of him and left both hands free. He did not come back to her. For a moment his body was black in the cave entrance, crouched and silent, and then he was gone. Juana moved to the entrance and looked out. She peered like an owl from the hole in the mountain, and the baby slept under the blanket on her back, his face turned sideways against her neck and shoulder. She could feel his warm breath against her skin, and Juana whispered her combination of prayer and magic, her Hail Marys and her ancient intercession against the black, unhuman things. The night seemed a little less dark when she looked out and to the east there was a lightning in the sky, down near the horizon where the moon would show. And looking down, she could see the cigarette of the man on watch. Kino edged like a slow lizard down the smooth rock shoulder. He had turned his neck string so that the great knife hung down from his back and could not clash against the stone. His spread fingers gripped the mountain, and his bare toes found support through contact, and even his chest lay against the stone so that he would not slip. For any sound, a rolling pebble or a sigh, a little slip of flesh on rock would rouse the watchers below. Any sound that was not germane to the night would make them alert. But the night was not silent. The little tree frogs that lived near the stream twittered like birds, and the high metallic ringing of the cicadas filled the mountain cleft. And Kino's own music was in his head, the music of the enemy, low and pulsing, nearly asleep. But the song of the family had become as fierce and sharp and feline as the snarl of a female puma. The family song was alive now, and driving him down on the dark enemy. The harsh cicada seemed to take up its melody, and the twittering tree frogs called little phrases of it. And Kino crept silently as a shadow down the smooth mountain face. One bare foot moved a few inches, and the toes touched the stone and gripped, and the other foot a few inches, and then the palm of one hand a little downward, and then the other hand, until the whole body, without seeming to move, had moved. Kino's mouth was open, so that even his breath would make no sound, for he knew that he was not invisible. If the watcher, sensing movement, looked at the dark place against the stone which was his body, he could see him. Kino must move so slowly he would not draw the watcher's eyes. It took him a long time to reach the bottom and to crouch behind a little dwarf palm. His heart thundered in his chest, and his hands and face were wet with sweat. He crouched and took great, slow, long breaths to calm himself. Only twenty feet separated him from the enemy now, and he tried to remember the ground between. Was there any stone which might trip him in his rush? He kneaded his legs against cramp and found that his muscles were jerking after their long tension. And then he looked apprehensively to the east. The moon would rise in a few moments now, and he must attack before it rose. He could see the outline of the Watcher, but the sleeping men were below his vision. It was the Watcher Kino must find, must find quickly and without hesitation. Silently he drew the amulet string over his shoulder and loosened the loop from the horn handle of his great knife. He was too late, for as he rose from his crouch, the silver edge of the moon slipped above the eastern horizon, and Kino sank back behind his bush. 
It was an old and ragged moon, but it threw hard light and hard shadow into the mountain cleft. And now Kino could see the seated figure of the Watcher on the little beach beside the pool. The Watcher gazed full at the moon, and then he lighted another cigarette, and the match illumined his dark face for a moment. There could be no waiting now. When the Watcher turned his head, Kino must leap. His legs were as tight as wound springs. And then, from above, came a little murmuring cry. The Watcher turned his head to listen, and then he stood up, and one of the sleepers stirred on the ground and awakened and asked quietly, What is it? I don't know, said the Watcher. It sounded like a cry, almost like a human, like a baby. The man who had been sleeping said, You can't tell. Some coyote bitch with a litter. I've heard a coyote pop cry like a baby. The sweat rolled in drops down Kino's forehead and fell into his eyes and burned them. The little cry came again, and the watcher looked up the side of the hill to the dark cave. Coyote, maybe, he said, and Kino heard the harsh click as he cocked the rifle. If it's a coyote, this'll stop it, the watcher said as he raised the gun. Kino was in mid-leap when the gun crashed, and the barrel flash made a picture on his eyes. The great knife swung and crunched hollowly. It bit through neck and deep into chest, and Kino was a terrible machine now. He grasped the rifle even as he wrenched free his knife. His strength and his movement and his speed were a machine. He whirled and struck the head of the seated man like a melon. The third man scrabbled away like a crab, slipped into the pool, and then he began to climb frantically, to climb up the cliff where the water penciled down. His hands and feet threshed in the tangle of the wild grapevine, and he whimpered and gibbered as he tried to get up. But Kino had become as cold and deadly as steel. Deliberately he threw the lever of the rifle, and then he raised the gun and aimed deliberately and fired. He saw his enemy tumble backward into the pool, and Kino strode to the water. In the moonlight he could see the frantic, frightened eyes, and Kino aimed and fired between the eyes. And then Kino stood uncertainly. Something was wrong. Some signal was trying to get through to his brain. Tree frogs and cicadas were silent now. And then Kino's brain cleared from its red concentration, and he knew the sound. The keening, moaning, rising, hysterical cry from the little cave in the side of the stone mountain. The cry of death. Everyone in La Paz remembers the return of the family. There may be some old ones who saw it, but those whose fathers and whose grandfathers told it to them remember it nevertheless. It is an event that happened to everyone. It was late in the golden afternoon when the first little boys ran hysterically in the town and spread the word that Kino and Juana were coming back. And everyone hurried to see them. The sun was settling toward the western mountains, and the shadows on the ground were long. And perhaps that was what left the deep impression on those who saw them. The two came from the rutted country road into the city, and they were not walking in single file, Kino ahead and Juana behind, as usual, but side by side. The sun was behind them, and their long shadows stalked ahead, and they seemed to carry two towers of darkness with them. Kino had a rifle across his arm, and Juana carried her shawl like a sack over her shoulder, and in it was a small, limp, heavy bundle. The shawl was crusted with dried blood, and the bundle swayed a little as she walked. Her face was hard and lined and leathery with fatigue and with the tightness with which she fought fatigue, and her wide eyes stared inward on herself. She was as remote and as removed as heaven. Kino's lips were thin, and his jaws tight, and the people say that he carried fear with him, that he was as dangerous as a rising storm. The people say that the two seemed to be removed from human experience, that they had gone through pain and had come out on the other side, that there was almost a magical protection about them. And those people who had rushed to see them crowded back and let them pass, and did not speak to them. Kino and Juana walked through the city as though it were not there. Their eyes glanced neither right nor left nor up nor down, but stared only straight ahead. 
Their legs moved a little jerkily, like well-made wooden dolls, and they carried pillars of black fear about them. And as they walked through the stone and plaster city, brokers peered at them from barred windows, and servants put one eye to a slitted gate, and mothers turned the faces of their youngest children inward against their skirts. Kino and Juana strode side by side through the stone and plaster city and down among the brush houses, and the neighbors stood back and let them pass. Juan Tomas raised his hand in greeting and did not say the greeting, and left his hand in the air for a moment, uncertainly. In Kino's ears the song of the family was as fierce as a cry. He was immune and terrible, and his song had become a battle cry. They trudged past the burned square where their house had been without even looking at it. They cleared the brush that edged the beach and picked their way down the shore toward the water, and they did not look toward Kino's broken canoe. And when they came to the water's edge, they stopped and stared out over the gulf. And then Kino laid the rifle down, and he dug among his clothes, and then he held the great pearl in his hand. He looked into its surface, and it was gray and ulcerous. Evil faces peered from it into his eyes, and he saw the light of burning. And in the surface of the pearl he saw the frantic eyes of the man in the pool. And in the surface of the pearl he saw Coyotito lying in the little cave with the top of his head shot away. And the pearl was ugly. It was gray like a malignant growth. And Kino heard the music of the pearl, distorted and insane. Kino's hand shook a little, and he turned slowly to Juana and held the pearl out to her. She stood beside him, still holding her dead bundle over her shoulder. She looked at the pearl in his hand for a moment, and then she looked into Kino's eyes and said softly, No, you. And Kino drew back his arm and flung the pearl with all his might. Kino and Juana watched it go, winking and glimmering under the setting sun. They saw the little splash in the distance, and they stood side by side, watching the place for a long time. And the pearl settled into the lovely green water, and dropped toward the bottom. The waving branches of the algae called to it and beckoned to it. The lights on its surface were green and lovely. It settled down to the sand bottom among the fern-like plants. Above the surface of the water was a green mirror, and the pearl lay on the floor of the sea. A crab scampering over the bottom raised a little cloud of sand, and when it settled, the pearl was gone, and the music of the pearl drifted to a whisper and disappeared. The End <laughs>